Good evening, everybody. Last day of class. Last day of this class for uh, agencies. Then we only have two left. We have principals, basically, but it's split in two. So we're going to get through this as quick as we can uh, so that we can get through the whole program. And then we'll just start letting Mr. Aiden teach. So uh, <laughs> So tonight we're going through the DTPA. So we're going through this evening, uh, Deceptive Trades Practices Act. Uh, and so as you can tell, there's a lot of material that we got to cover tonight. Uh, the applicability of the real estate broker and salesperson, uh, the exemptions from the DTPA, uh, the fraud versus misrepresentation, uh, the deceptive trade practices and consumer protection, Basically, that's going to be what we're going to go through. As you can see, there's a lot there, but I want to get on into the material. So the applicability of the uh, real estate broker and salesperson exemption uh, from the DTPA. Now, real property was originally exempted from this act, okay? And that was in 1973. Because of the fact of the matter is, it was kind of difficult to be deceptive in real estate in some situations, okay? Uh, most people kind of knew about it, plus homes, they are not as technically advanced as they've come over the years. So real estate really was initially exempt. However, in 1975, the act actually was amended to include real property. Uh, and so they directly applied to real estate professionals uh, especially in regards to the many consumer lawsuits that came out of uh, people basically cheating and basically uh, doing uh, deceptive types of practices. So the DTPA came out uh, and it basically, what the purpose of the DTPA is, is that if Mr. Aiden here, if he was to go over, say Mr. Aiden that you've gone over and uh, you found out that there are, like we said before, termites in a property and you do not disclose that, and Miss Davenport purchases your property, guess what? Poor Miss Davenport's now got to deal with your headache that you didn't tell her about. And she wouldn't be dealing with that headache had you been open and honest with her, okay? Now, again, it was amended again in 2011 with exemptions from licensees. Uh, the exemptions do not apply, though, to express misrepresentation of material fact and cannot be characterized as advice, judgment, or opinion, okay? Uh, so you can, it, like I said, it was amended in 11 with exemptions for the licensees. However, Aiden, in this situation as an agent, it's not going to apply if you expressively state a false statement. And that you should know was false, okay? So, and it cannot, you cannot turn around and characterize it as advice, judgment, or opinion, okay? You also cannot do what's called a deliberate non-disclosure, okay? Miss uh, Leela tells you, Travis, there is, um, she tells you, says, Travis, I have foundation issues and structure issues, and you know it. But you tell her, well, Miss Leela, you don't want to disclose that on the seller's disclosure because that's going to limit you selling your house. Well, you're deliberately not disclosing what she told you. Okay. Um, and it, what's an unconscionable act, this is that one that shocks the court. It like really, it's like, whoa, what did you do, Aiden? Like, what in the heck's your problem here? Okay. So an unconscionable act is that it cannot be characterized as advice, judgment, or opinion either. But these are the ones that the exemptions do not apply to. Now, you can view the exemptions with caution. Future case law, of course, is always going to determine the interpretation of the exemptions. And ethical standards for even innocent misrepresentations can still be enforceable by TREC under trailer or TREC rules. So, while you may not end up, uh, you may not get hit under this rule, if you still make an innocent misrepresentation, they can still come after you under TREC because TRAILA may be against it. So, and also trade association codes of ethics. 
So the key thing that we want to talk about is what exactly is this thing we call fraud, okay? Now fraud is a criminal act as well as a DTP violation. So fraud is something that can either be crime or it can either be a DTPA violation, okay? So put it in layman's terms, you know for a fact, um, let's say Mr. Garrett knows for a fact that the property has structural issues, but he fraudulently misrepresents it. And because he misrepresents it, it may not be criminal fraud, but it can be a DTP, uh, DT, DTPA violation, which is a civil matter, okay? You see the differences here, okay? Now, intentional false misrepresentation is going to be one of those situations as well. If you are intentionally making false representations, it can fall under potential criminal fraud, okay? So you gotta be very careful in these situations. Also, the reliance on false information by a person taking action. If Ms. Davenport relied on Garrett on that false information, guess what? If she's relying on his false information and she takes action to purchase the house, well, then Ms. Davenport could come back and sue him for fraud. And that fraud for Mr. Uh, Garrett would be a DTPA violation. If it is unconscionable or it is criminal, he could also face criminal charges, okay? So you never, never, ever accept your client at the word. That's why whenever I go out and I look at a property, I kind of really look over the property as best I can. Now, is there a way you can hide things? Heck yeah. You can conceal stuff, but if you're intentionally concealing things, it can also still turn into fraud. Okay. Also, if Ms. Davenport, you relied on Garrett's, uh, basically his false information and you're damaged, it can be a result of that reliance. She could sue for that too. Okay. However, this is the problem. When it comes to DTPA, it's very hard to prove unless it's in what? Right. See, a lot of times, this is how you catch people. So here's a little a practice tip for you. So Ms. Davenport's out, and uh, she's put an offer in, Mr. Eugene, on your behalf to purchase um, Aiden's listing. Aiden is representing me. Ms. Davenport's representing you. You like my house. Ms. Davenport goes over and says, hey, Aiden. She texts Aiden. She says, hey, Aiden, uh, I was noticing when I was walking around, I saw, like, little, like, little hose and like mo looking things around the yard yeah uh, is that it looks like it's around the house is that termites and Aiden calls her no miss Davenport no that's not termites that's that's normal that's not termites so miss Davenport call or I mean you call miss Davenport and you tell her that and she says okay well can you put that in writing for me please could you put that in writing for me and send that over to me so that I can go ahead and I can give that to Mr. Eugene. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I'll get that to you later, Ms. Davenport. And you don't get it to her. <laughs> What's the problem with that situation? It's a he said, she said. So if, if, as, if I was Ms. Davenport, what I would have ended up doing was this. I would keep wanting what? What would, what would I keep doing? I'd keep doing what? Hey, where's that in writing? Hey, where's that in writing? You put that in writing? Can you do that in writing? Can you get that to me? Can you text? If they continue to call, say you keep calling, or she keeps calling you, and, and you keep calling her, but you won't put it in writing, that should be a red flag for Miss Davenport that what? There might actually be termites in that property. Okay? Agents are good at basically trying to not put things in writing. Okay, because if Miss Davenport sues, her best way to get it is through what? In writing. Now, what's another way Miss Davenport could do? Thankfully, in Texas, because of the the Patriot Act, guess what she could do? She could record the phone call. Only one party in the conversation has to be aware of it. So she could record the phone call of you saying, 
that, oh, there's no termites, none at all. Now, you, of course, would try to fight her and say you, she didn't have your consent and all that, but once a judge hears you say it, it's kind of hard to do what? To unhear it, if you know what I'm saying. Even if they say, we're not going to classify this, we're going to cut that from the record, the judge already now knows you said it. But again, it's very difficult to prove in some situations. It's not frequently pursued, though, in real estate transactions. A lot of people will threaten it. Okay, You're getting a criminal matter. You'll get lawyers. I've had this before. I've been in, in this industry long enough to, to have dealt with this. Lawyers will send over demand letters. and They'll say, Mr. Davenport, if you don't do this, 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 we're suing you under the DTPA. Okay. Like it's lost its bite. You know, or it's it's a uh, it's scare tactic. Okay. Now, of course, if Aiden gets one, you're probably going to be wanting to jump through hoops. Oh yeah. Okay. But in the situation is, if you've been a broker or been in this industry long enough, you've seen those letters, and <laughs> you're just like, okay, whatever. Okay. Uh. Now, the next thing is, is misrepresentation. So this is clear fraud. Misrepresentation is negligence. And if you've never taken any law courses, negligence is something as simple as this. Aiden is driving down the road, and he's texting on his phone while he's driving, and he gets in a wreck. Did you intentionally get in a wreck, Mr. Aiden? No. What were you doing? You negligently got in a wreck because the fact is, where was your attention? On my phone. On your phone, not drive. Okay. So again, it's negligent behavior. It's something as simple as this. Is would the normal person would say, for example, would Mr. Eugene, a normal lay person, would he had ended up, would he had known or basically call on to say the foundation issues like if if you sent mr eugene into a house without any real estate trainings and mr eugene you see cracks on the walls around the windows cracks around the, the concrete what are you going to assume about that house not very stable not stable is it is it a foundation possibly possibly could there be structure of course so if there's if that is something that a normal everyday person would know and then Stefan comes in here and he's representing Miss Leela and shows that house. And he's like, yeah, this is a very good house. I mean, it's got great bones, good structure. You should buy this, Miss Leela. Well, what has Stefan just done? False. He negligently provided false representation. Okay. He ended up, you never, if you're not certain about something, you never, ever, ever say it. I get, I get people all the time. All of my real estate agents have been through this, have shown houses, and they'll ask you, and Stefan and Aiden and, and Travis can all tell you that in these situations, a client will see something, they'll say, well, what is this? What's this crack off the window? And what happens? What should you say, Aiden? I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. What would you say? Um, let's see if it's like settlement. Possibly a normal settlement or but let me ask you, but let me ask you this question are you a licensed inspector I'm not. so should you even say anything to that fact uh, you yes, no. your best bet if you see any any type of cracks is you could say something like this say I'm representing Travis I could say something to the fact of the matter is you know Travis I'm really not certain about that. It could be settlement. It could be foundation. There's a lot of things it could be. But if you like the house, we can get an inspector out here to check it for you. And that situation is, I am not negligently saying, oh, it's settlement or, oh, it's this. You're not licensed for that. Okay. Your job is simply to come out and just say, it may be this, it may be that, but we really need to get an inspector out if you're interested. That's what you say, okay? Because if Stefan wants to say, oh, well, that's just settlement, no big deal, and it's actually a huge deal, guess who they're coming after? Stefan and me, because the fact is he's made a negligent 
representation. Okay. Material factor, of course, in the decision to contract. If there's something material, something major, then we need Mr. Grossman or any other agent to make certain that they convey that to the other party. I've had people before that they'll tell me something. It, it, me and Mr. Grossman actually just dealt with this. I, when I first went and met with the client, and Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Davenport, you know, you met the client yesterday. We first went and met with the client. Uh, they told us that their house was in immaculate condition. And it looked it. I'm not gonna lie, perfect condition house, okay? We go through it, beautiful. Next thing I know, we send over the seller's disclosure to the buyer and immediately we get a text before we even get a chance to read it that there was a fire at the house. I was like, what? That was never disclosed to me. Now, would that have been negligent representation on me or Stefan? No, because it's not something you don't, you as a real estate agent don't say, well, come on up here, Miss Davenport. Let's go look in the attic of the house. You don't take your, come on, bring all your kids and your family, your mom, brother. Let's all just go up in the attic and look. You don't do that. So, of course, that's not going to end up being something that could possibly be negligent. Now, again, do not have to prove, though, intention under misrepresentation. There doesn't have to be intention. Aiden could have just ended up. He could have, you know, he may have accidentally forgot about it. You're like me, I got five million things going on in my head. Aiden may tell me something and I forget to tell Mr. Garrett about it. Well, was it intentional? Nope. Was it negligent? Yep. Because I should have told him, I should have wrote it down. This is what? Easier to prove. So while this back here, fraud is very difficult, misrepresentation is very easy. Okay. Now under the DTPA and consumer- I have a question. Yes, ma'am. What is innocent false re representation? Is that where you just didn't know? Innocent is something that you are, say you're a brand new agent, Ms. Leela, you get your real estate license today and you sign with a brokerage that doesn't train you, okay? Mm -hmm. And you walk through a house as you're walking through showing a house to your best friend. And your best friend says, well, this is really weird. You know, as I'm walking through here, I feel kind of like I'm going down, like I'm sloping down. And you say, oh, that's probably just normal settlement. And she relies on you. You yourself ended up, you didn't mean to be neglectful. You didn't mean to be intentional. You were just thinking, well, maybe my house does that and that's normal. So that's normal. And that would be an innocent misrepresentation where you're making an assumption or representation that you're not 100% certain on. Does that kind of make sense to you? That makes sense. I'm assuming you still get in trouble. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah but it won't be as severe as negligent. Does that make sense? Yes, I understand. So it's kind of more the lower part of it, not the higher part. So if we were to like really go and measure these, fraud would be your worst, then your negligent, and then your innocent. If you okay. That. Okay. Good question, by the way. Thank you. Anytime. Now the DTPA, of course, is a state law that is intended to be liberally construed, very key there, Mr. Eugene, what's this word right here? What's that mean? Yeah, you know, it's liberally. It means it, it means it's like this, we can't go outside the box. It means you get to go and apply it to almost anything, okay? So liberally construed, meaning that it's very broad, okay? So liberally construed and applied to promote its underlying purposes to, of course, protect consumers. Like last night, Cody ended up, he provided some good information. He was talking though, but he was talking about it from a normal person, not a licensee. These laws are written on whose behalf? The consumer, not who? The licensees, okay? 
Again, it's a protection for the consumer against any false, misleading, or deceptive practices, any unconscionable actions. And when we think of unconscionable, I put it always like this when I when I hear my mom, when she hears something that they, I just always imagine unconscionable. Imagine when you got some like just shocking news. You know, somebody tells you that uh, your best friend has cancer or something to that nature or, or Aiden got somebody pregnant today. There you go. Okay. Don't even put that on me. Yeah, you tell us. Yeah, tell us. <laughs> He was pregnant. He yeah. was busy. But in this situation is, is that it's shocking. You see, everybody goes, what? Okay. That's unconscionable. It's where the judge would be like, whoa, like I wasn't expecting that. Okay. Breaches of warranty. Okay. Breaches of warranty is another one. Out of these three, Miss Davenport, which one of these do you think is the one that's going to get the most punishment? Like the, the, not just a slap on the wrist, but I mean, like, you're getting everything thrown at you. Which of those three do you think is going to be the biggest one? I don't think. It's going to be that one right there. Really? That unconscionable action. So false misleading. The false misleading and deceptives. Those are sometimes simple little lies. Okay. The unconscionable one is where Aiden has been selling properties that he knows himself, he knows that there's structural damages or he's cut corners and he's getting little old ladies in these houses. And then after they move in, there's tons of damage that he's now purposely incurred. So they cost a lot of money. Do you see how that's a bigger thing than just, well, you know, there's maybe there's some basic foundation here. That one's more of that, oh my gosh, what were you doing, Aiden? Like, what in the world, man? So unconscionable, you're going to get the book thrown at you, okay? These, while they can be bad, this is second. This is the second. The third is the breaches of a warranty, okay? But the unconscionable is the ones that's normally going to be the worst of the worst, okay? Now, can, let's ask this question now, Mr. Eugene. Can you have all three of these in one matter? Yes, you can. You can have all three of these. Mr. Aiden is misleading little old grannies to purchase his properties in which he goes into these properties and he's purposely setting them up so that they break after 30 to 60 days. And then these warranties that he makes, he breaches them by not following up what he said he would follow. Say problem, yep. and Mr. Aiden, you do that to all to those little old ladies, and you preach all these. It ain't gonna be pretty for you, sir. Not at all, okay? Because if a judge finds that out, guess how? <laughs> guess what, Mr. Aiden? He's gonna hit you with everything that's possible, okay? And you deserve it by that situation. So it's a very powerful weapon for consumers. See, a lot of people don't know about the DTP. I'll tell y'all something. See, I wish that I knew so much that I know now. I wish I, when I was younger, when my dad, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. I had bought a car from a place here in town. I'm not going to say their name simply because of the fact that I don't want to cause any defamation or slander, but I'm just going to say I bought a, a vehicle. And me and my father went and looked at it, drove it home. Ended up after I drove it home, what was it, about a week later, all these little things started going wrong. And I was going to class one day in this car. And when I was driving, I came to a stop sign and the whole car just died. Whole car. My mom had to come over, had to get me, had to have a tow to, to the shop. And the shop told me, said, Justin, there are so many things that they did to this car. The computer needs to be replaced, transmission, the engine, all these things need to be replaced. I ended up being a broke, poor little kid, and, you know, I was a college kid. My parents didn't have a ton of money to go spend for an attorney. What did we do? We went and just traded the car in and got me an O. Okay? But the thing is, is that DTPA, had I known about that, I could have gone back and sued them for the damages, plus all the money I'd spent in it, plus my parents' money that they spent into it, and sued them for three times damages. 
I could have gone after them. It's a very powerful weapon. It's so powerful that say that Mr. Uh, Travis back there, he has his truck that he's wanting to sell. So he takes it to uh, Mechanic Eugene, and Mechanic Eugene goes over, and he uh, what's what uh, he fixes it to a way is it uh, basically kind of messes around with it to get it to work smoothly. Everything works perfectly, okay? But he does it temporarily, okay? Aiden, you walk up to Travis, and you say, hey, man, how much you want for this truck? Oh, man, it's... This was my baby. I took care of it. She's been in garage cap. Great vehicle. You, you, you're getting a steal. I'm getting rooked out of this whole thing, just selling it so low. I'm going to sell it to you, just because I like you, $15,000, just for you. I mean, look at it. You should go drive it. It's a great condition, man. Aiden goes, drives it around. Oh, man, this is I'll not pay, I'll pay you to take that truck. <laughs> that truck right but the thing is, is that, Aiden, you go over there and you're like, man, I'll, I'll buy that from you, Travis. And you buy it from him. And you drive off. Well, when you drive off, guess what happens, Aiden? About a day or two later, everything, <laughs> everything <laughs> falls apart. What's the problem with that, Mr. Aiden? He told me it was perfect condition. Good to go. He told you it was in great condition. It was wonderful. And guess what? After Mr. Travis gets that money, what's going to happen to you, Travis? I'm out of here. He ain't around here no more. Yep. He, he gone. Okay. And now you're what? Hiring a private detective. <laughs> Hunt him down. You are trying to find him, right? Yep. Yep. So in that sense, let me know. Hey, 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 but the key thing in that situation is, yeah, it's it's yeah. that situation. It's such a big thing because guess what? It's easy to prove. It's easy to prove because all you got to show is what, Aiden? You did what? You bought the car. He promised you what? It's in great condition. It's in great condition. And what did he do? Left. And he left and it broke down. Yeah. He lied to you. So you will be able to recover more than your actual losses. So if you bought that car from him for 15,000, you could sue him under the DTPA and get three times the damages. Because the purpose of this law is to keep a or Travis from doing what to other people? From screwing them over, okay? It does not require any proof of intent to deceive. In this situation, because it's a car, Travis does not have to be intentionally doing it. He could be accidentally doing it. So that means, say, Mr. Eugene sells his vehicle to you, that Mr. Eugene has taken to Miss Davenport's uh, dealership and fixed every single time. And Mr. Eugene, if you're taking it to the dealership, what do you think? You think that car is what? Bad condition or great condition? Because it's going to the dealership, right? Yeah, so when you tell Mr. Aiden, I, I took this thing and I've it's been taken care of, it's in great condition, and he drives it down the street and the whole thing falls apart. Well, what's the problem? Does there have to be any proof of intent? No. That's why what do you tell people? I just want you to know I've taken it to the dealership. I can't guarantee you anything, but I'm just selling it as is. It can drive down here and fall apart. But I just want you to know I'm selling it as is okay so you're taking it how it is in this condition no don't think that the minute you drive down the road and it falls apart you come back getting your money back it's done okay there are certain terms in your book we're not going to go through but these are just some basic terms now do you need to know these for the test not really not really okay you all know these even if they did pop up What's goods, Aiden? Uh, tangible items. Is this a good? Yes. That's a phone. Okay. Is this podium a good? Yes. Okay. What's a service, Mr. Eugene? Something you do, something you perform for somebody. That's right. Something that you do. Right. Now, this one's a trick one, Travis. 
This may, you might need nuclear like rocket science here, okay? What's a person? Ooh. Oh, good one. Oh, you caught me here. <laughs> the chair, the table. Yeah. It is, what is this? What do we call this thing right here? Good. This is a good. Okay. Oh, I was wondering. <laughs> Pop it up, baby. What? You're good. So, but a person, of course, is your normal person, okay? I'm cold worse. <laughs> a consumer? Now, here's my question Is a consumer always a person? Depends on how it's working. Depends on how it's working. Unconscionable, we already talked about. And you need to know the difference between knowingly and intentionally. See, knowingly is kind of like, and I'll put this in Miss Leela's terms, okay? Knowingly is like this. If Leela sits down with you, Aiden, and she, she's a therapist, and she comes and she sits down to meet with you, and she notices cuts on your wrist, what should she, what should any person that's watching you and Leela, if we're a little fly on the wall, what should we hope Leela's going to ask you about? Huh? What happened? What happened? See, because Miss Leela, in real life, if you see a patient in your office that has cuts on their wrist, what does that imply? The layman terms is that they are cutter. Right. And is there a chance that they could try to end up killing themselves? Yes, uh, be it intentionally or not, that's that's a possibility. That's right. So in that situation, is here's your difference. Knowingly, Miss Leela should, as a lay person, should recognize that, observe it, and address it. Okay. That's knowingly. Same thing with real estate. You have to think of yourself as a therapist in, in how they in houses. Meaning that Aiden, as you show houses, as you're doing this and you're learning, you should be noticing things that are out of place. You should be observing these things. You see cracks in walls, you see rot, dry rot. You see, you'll get to start looking around toilets. Why do you want to look around toilets, Travis? What's the main purpose to look around the toilet? What could possibly be wrong there? Leaking and water is that a big deal? No, no big deal, right? Yeah, just just some dry rot, and, you know. And by the way, if you get moist wood, what does that sometimes lead to? What comes to moist termites? So those are things that knowingly, when they if you're going to a court, they're going to be more on me to know those things than you, Aiden, because I've been in this industry long. But if you've been in the same industry, same time as I have, and you missed something that was obvious, guess what? You should have known it. They're still going to punish you. Okay. Intentionally, we know what intentionally is. Purpose. Okay. We talked about, of course, innocent misrepresentations, misleading statements. Okay. These are key things that you have to be aware of. Now there is, if you ever get bored and you're sitting at home and you want to, you know, you're looking for some reading material at night to put you to sleep, okay, pull out the laundry list is what we call it. The DTPA has a laundry list basically of everything that it applies to. It applies to little transactions as simple as this. Hey, I'll sell you my cell phone if you give me some money. When I know that the cell phone is not working. Yeah, that, that small of a thing. If I know for a fact that this cell phone is a piece of crap, and I'm just getting it working just so Stephen can buy it, and then he purchases it, and I disappear, if he can find me, guess what? Stephen can do what? He can get three times his money. Okay? See, Real estate, I always watch like all these little Facebook groups that they sell things in. And I'll see sometimes people going over and they're like, I spent this money and it was a piece of junk or blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, sue them. It's a DTPA. It's a violation. Go after them. I guarantee you they won't ever do it again. 
after they got to sue, be sued, even if it's even if it's a thirty dollar transaction, that person got to pay ninety bucks. They'll learn yeah. never to do it again. Okay, but there is a laundry list. Okay. Also, corresponding violations of TRALA, which can result if you may not say, Mr. Eugene, that you did something bad, but it's not DTPA, basically an opportunity to fall under a DTPA suit. That's fine. They'll just do what? Well, spell trick. Follow violation under TRALA. We'll just take your license from you. Good. We're going to solve it one way or another. Okay. Again, there's verbal and nonverbal. And this is very, very important, extremely important. Okay. You do not ever, like I tell people this all the time, you never do these two things. Number one, you never guarantee. You never guarantee. Hey, do you know what's uh, can you can you guarantee that uh, that Mr. Garrett is gonna make an A in his class? No. Nope. Why can't you? I don't have any control over it. You have no control over it? No. Nope. So then how can you guarantee that a house is going to be in great condition? I can. That's right. While you may, your customer may come up and say, man, you're guaranteeing that you're going to get me this house, right? No, I can't do that. This. Sorry, I'll do the best I can, but I can't guarantee you. Okay. Another thing is, you never recommend experts. So used to back prior to the 2008, real estate companies used to do this. We want to make some extra money. Our agents are working, but we want to make some additional money over here too. So, hey, Miss Davenport, I hear that you're, you are a handy, a handy woman and you do a great job with handy, uh, handy work, okay? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Miss Davenport, I will put you at the top of my vendor list if you pay me a thousand dollars a month. I'll put you at the top of my vendor list. And Miss Davenport's like, hmm, okay, yeah, I want to be. You've got a lot of clients. I want to be at the top of your list so I can get your clients. Well, guess what? I put her at the top of my list, and people are going to assume what? She is a expert that is what? Recommended by who? My company. And if something goes wrong, Miss Davenport, who are they coming after? They come straight after me. Okay? That's why you do not ever, if you're ever going to give a list, it's fine to give a list. Number one, you never just give one person. Mr. Eugene says, hmm, Justin, you know anybody that's a lender? Yeah, we'll use Jake. That's it. Nobody else? Just Jake. That's all I want you to use. Just Jake. Well, I like that too. No, Jake. What's the problem? What could go wrong you know, on Jake's end, Travis? Well, if something comes up that you doesn't get what's supposed to get done. Comes back on you to recommend you in the first place. That's right. That's why you always be careful not to recommend an expert. I can say something as simple as this. I can say, Mr. Eugene, I have Jake, but also Miss Davenport and Miss Leela and Mr. Jacob are some lenders that you can reach out to. Okay. However, and I do not allow this at all in my office, not even myself. Some or some brokerages will allow for those people to take them to fancy dinners and all. I don't ever allow that. Okay. Period. If I refer a person, if I refer, say for example, eight, and I refer you to Stephen, and you're a lender, and you say, Justin, I want to take you out to dinner. <coughs> No, because what's the what's the implication there? What, what's implied if he takes me out to dinner after I give him a client name, Travis? What do people see? He's trying to get your next one. Uh-huh. He's, right He's buying me off. And then what could happen? I can lose my license, and what could happen to you, Aiden? Lose yours. You don't do that. It's fine if you have no clients with Aiden, and Aiden wants to take you to lunch. No big deal. But it can't be right after I close with Stephen. You see what I'm saying? Because it still is a celebratory meal. Don't do that. Okay. Waiver of rights. There are very strict guidelines for how your clients can waive their rights under the DTPA. 
But I'm just going to tell you something. If you go over and you have them waive their rights from the DTPA and you are unconscionable in your actions, most likely the court's going to say what to this waiver? And they're going to say, boop, X. A judge can throw that out. Okay? So while it can be written, it has to be writing, both face type and represented by an attorney and no disparate, uh, disparate in bargaining positions, it's still, if you are still writing it up, say Aiden drafts his forms up to these little old ladies and he puts it in there and he gets them to sign it. Well, if they didn't understand what Aiden said, the judge can say what, Mr. Eugene? Right. Sorry, Mr. Aiden, you didn't explain it to them. No, no. Not going to allow it. We're still going to put it, put it against you. Okay. There has been, of course, cases that's been out there. Known defects must be disclosed. If you know that there's a problem, you have to disclose it. The buyer has a right to inspect. And as is, is basically not classified as boilerplate. Okay. Both parties must be similarly situated, meaning that both parties need to be very close in knowledge. Aiden, if you're an experienced construction or real estate guy, and you've been in this for 20 years, and you got a little old uh, grandpa stepping here coming up to you to buy a house, well, are y'all on the same level? No. So who's the court going to be more favorable to? Why is that? Because he doesn't have the knowledge that I need. The little old grandpa has no knowledge of this. You're the expert. I tell people it's like me taking me, putting me out at my dad's work. You put me in front of some of the machines he works, I'm going to be like, huh? You want me to, and especially when it comes to, hey, can you calculate down to the such and such 16th? What in the heck are you talking about? Talk about, I probably hit a button and blow it up, right, Travis? Or, okay, I don't know. So we got to make it fair. Again, it basically, this court case, the Irwin versus Smiley, applied the as-is standards. You can read about these on your own. There also was the buyer could not pr uh, prove the seller or licensee knew of the water well. That's another part, is proving things. As far as fraud, you have to be able to prove it. Misrepresentation is it's knowingly, okay? But in this situation, a water well, where's that normally at, Mr. Eugene? Do you just open a, open a door and there it is? Let's see. It's down in the ground. It's in the ground. How often, uh, Stephanie, you just did a closing today. Uh, when y'all uh, checked the stuff, did you get down to the ground? Like you dig down and got into the house and we'll get, you did all that, right? Uh, no, but my client pretty much almost did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You put in the same wood? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in this situation is, is that you've got to be very careful in these situations. In regards to notice and inspection, it does require a 60-day notice of suit. The defendant may inspect the disputed goods, and the defendant may offer to settle. But it's not an admission of guilt. It may limit the damages, and it may limit attorney's fees. The whole key of DTPA is this, is that they want to try to remedy the matter amongst the individuals before bringing it to a court of law. Okay. The exemptions from prohibit or prohibition against the waiver, if a contract is written, written waiver of rights may be enforceable if the total consideration exceeds 100,000, legal counsel has been involved, and it does not involve a main residence. Okay. Now, if the contract is oral or written, the waiver of rights may be enforceable if consideration exceeds 500,000 and of course does not involve the residents. In 2011 revision, it meant to insulate licensees in professional services. There are cases if the professional service was based upon opinion, advice, judgment, or similar skills. Okay, meaning that in this situation is if we give advice, that's the point, if I give advice about a house, I should not be worried that Aiden's going to sue me because I'm giving advice. 
That's why whenever somebody asks me for my advice, I will tell them, I'll give you my advice. However, this does not basically equal me going over and being a, like an inspector or an engineer. This is just my thought. I may be completely wrong, but I always tell more than just, yeah, that's, that's a, that's foundation. You don't know that. Okay. You're not certain. Guys, I've seen some some foundation that I thought was like major foundation, only to find out that it was just basically a settlement, and they didn't properly build it right, and the cracking in the walls just happened. Nothing wrong with the structure. Structure's great. It was just the building. There was a flaw in the building. There are also exemptions from the prohibition against the waiver, and that exemptions do not apply if it cannot be characterized as advice, judgment, or opinion. And it is expressed misrepresentation of material fact or a deliberate non-disclosure or an unconscionable act, okay? Of course, we talked about the unconscionable act as a form of deception, equitable relief to the person who was tricked or swindled, of course, is gonna be the one that's going to be protected. One of the main cases was the Smith's case, and it was that Smith knowingly and intentionally committed fraud. Mr. Aiden, if you go out and like I said, you know of something and you do not provide it, it can be intentional. That's why I tell people, be careful what you write. How you write it can be what? It can be construed against you very quickly. If a client texts you, and I had this happen with one of my real estate agents once, way back, I wasn't a broker at the time, I was just a, a lead, a team lead, and I uh, had a real estate agent that was a newbie, and ended up, they went over and they were just kind of just not taking it serious, they didn't take real estate serious, and they just kind of put stuff on the, the messages, like, yeah, yeah, huh, okay, yeah, huh, yeah, huh. wasn't even reading the text messages that they were getting. Ended up, their client got sued. I got involved in it because I was the team lead. The client got involved. Like, it's just a big old mess. We all lost 2500 bucks, every one of us. Because the agent was taking this more of as a, eh, this ain't a big deal. This is just something I can do on the side. Can't do that. When you're in a contract, you got to be 100% in it. Can't be 50%, okay? Producing cause, the contributing factor that produces the injury or the damage. Okay, you gotta be very careful. What exactly caused, it's like the procuring cause. What exactly produced the injury or the damage? It's not required to prove deception or misleading act, and it can be related to material fact or directly caused by the injury. Again, there need only to show that the act was a contributing factor. So let me put it this way. Aiden, you're representing uh, Mr. Eugene. And I go over and I'm trying to find out some information from you and you just keep dodging me. You keep dodging, dodging. And the next day we're closing. You dodge and dodge and dodge. And I'm like, and I'm like, Stephan, what do you want me to do, man? And you just won't answer our question. And you're like, Hey, Jesus, Justin, this puts me in a bad bind because if I proceed, this is going to happen. If I don't proceed, I'm, I'm homeless. What do I do? And I keep trying to text Aiden, and he just won't answer his phone, won't, ain't, won't do nothing. He just won't text me or nothing. Guess what, Mr. Aiden? Hmm. Your act does not always have to be physical. Your non-act can also be a contributing factor. So because you would not respond to me, my client purchases a house and is injured for $15,000, guess what happens? We come after you. And well, we, we won't come directly after you, we'll go after Mr. Eugene, okay? Because Mr. Eugene hired Mr., uh, Mr. Technically, he hired Mr. Travis, the broker, and Travis appointed you. So we're gonna go after Mr. Eugene, but guess what's gonna happen? Mr. Eugene, who are you going after? Travis. And Travis, who are you going after? That's right. No. <laughs> so in that situation is, you got to be very careful. 
Okay, you got to be very careful. Again, buyers are always classified as a consumer. Reliance is not an element of the producing cause. There doesn't have to be any reliance. And verbal misrepresentation can be admissible. Okay, if Aiden tells me, this is where you got to be very careful. That's why I'm slowly building my case on one transaction I'm dealing with. In this situation, me and Mr. Grossman are working on a transaction right now. And the agent the other day said, well, we're, I guarantee you we're going to get this deal done. What's that mean, Mr. Grossman? I guarantee I'm going to get this deal done. Shouldn't have done that. Why? What did she just do? Can't guarantee anything. She can't guarantee it. She can't guarantee anything. So in that situation is I'm slowly building my case in case something happens, what happens? We can go after them. Okay. So you have to understand that verbal misrepresentation can be admissible. Now damages, of course, are discussed in DTPA section 17.5, and it's the economic damages, attorney's fees, and court costs. Okay. Now economic damages, see, people don't understand this in this situation. Say, for example, I'll use the hypothetical, Mr. Grossman, let's play out your situation right now that you're dealing with. So your client, Mr. Grossman, has gone into a property, purchasing a property. He, um, he's under contract. The buyer, or the seller, I'm sorry, the seller is over more because he did not follow up with his stuff, did not end up knowing exactly how much amount it is and stuff like that. So because of that failure to know his payoff information, he is now under contract at about a $15,000 less than what's actually owed. Okay, so there's a huge gap. My client, or not my client, but Mr. Grossman's client today ended up closed on his property. Because of this guy's issue, he's now having to pay what? one month's rent because this guy did not fulfill his duty. Mm -hmm. So now our client is what? In the hole, what? $1,500. Now, if this transaction, if he ends up, if he say that we can't get this deal closed for another two months, what happens? Two more months. So now we're at $4,500. Okay. So do you see where we're having issues here? See, people don't think about this. Now watch this too. Imagine if thankfully for him, for our client, he's still able to lease back the property. But imagine if he had sold this property and Ms. Davenport was moving into it. Ms. Davenport, are you going to let them just sit in your house that you just bought? Heck no, right? You can get out of my house. Well, in that situation, they might have had U-Haul trucks involved. They would have had to have meals. They would have had to eat out. They would have maybe been leaving out of a hotel. All of these little things do what? They add up. And if they add up, that all becomes economic damages. Economic damages. So under this situation, they're going to be sued. So say that this thing falls apart and it's a big mess, economic damages is going to cost a lot of money. Now, this is the problem. When things start hitting the fan, what does real estate agents normally do? Oh. Yeah. Mr. Grossman could have said, this is too much hell. I'm out of this place. And he walks. Well, now what did Mr. Grossman just do to himself now? He now brought himself into a what? economic damages because now he's got to find a new real estate agent to take control and now what happens now not only can they go after that party but they can go after mr grossman because he walked and if i allow mr grossman to walk now i bring myself into it okay that's why you always stay with your client until they do what mr travis till they do what to you give me my money nope till they <laughs> fire you oh yeah till they fire you because if that client comes in tomorrow and tells Mr. Grossman you're fired, what's the thing? Your liability's gone because you didn't want to get fired. Yeah, they fired him. They fired him, so there is no damage to him. You see how this works? So that's why when things get tough, 
You don't quit as a real estate agent. And you don't. You have to stay in it. But again, economic damages, attorney's fees, and court costs are all considered as damages. And if you're mentally anguished, say Mr. Grossman decided today, say Mr. Eugene, you're this client. He's like, I just can't deal with you no more, Mr. Eugene. I quit. He walks out. Well, guess what? Mr. Eugene, did you now have mental anguish? I sure did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> and now you're freaking out even more, and you're stressed, and you don't know what to do. And now, guess what? Now, Stephen, not only did you call him economic damages, but you also called him mental anguish. And so now, Mr. Grossman, he can end up, look at number three, up to three times economic damages for the mental anguish if committed knowingly. You see that? So Mr. Grossman, by just walking out on his client or his customer, well, not just for his client, he can be sued for three times whatever damages. And let me tell you, Mr. Grossman, I hope you don't get a very liberal judge because a liberal judge is going to already do what to that mental anguish part? It's going to be higher or lower? Either. And then if, if they put that there's $10,000 of mental anguish, then they get to multiply it by three. See the problem? Okay. So you have to make certain that you're completing and understand all of these. Again, the DTPA does limit enforceability of any waiver. Okay. The defense number one is that the liability and damage can be limited if the consumer filed in bad faith. Okay. And what we mean by this is this situation. Say in this situation that Miss Sheldon, I go sell her a house and I accidentally misrepresented something, okay? And she calls me and she's furious. She's yelling and screaming and all this. And I say, Miss Sheldon, what, what's wrong? And she's like, well, you said that they were going to paint the bathroom and they didn't paint it. And I said, well, I, I'm sorry, Miss Sheldon. I, I, I'm going to send my guy out to get him to paint it, whatever you want, my cost. And Miss Shelby goes down the courthouse the same day and files suit. That's filing with bad faith. Because she's wanting to do what? She's wanting to get revenge and not actually resolve the matter. So if I've made a reasonable attempt to settle and she still goes down and files suit, now you've ended up, you have that chance where you can use defense number one and your liability and damages would be limited. Okay. That's why most lawyers, when there's a problem, the very first thing that they do is if Aiden, my dad is upset at you, his attorney, Mr. Travis, is going to send you a letter and say, here's our demands, meet our demands. And if you call Mr. Travis and say, I don't have that kind of money, but I'll do, I'll come over and do some work for him to work off the debt. Well, you're making a, trying to make a reasonable attempt. And if they still fall suit, you can tell your, your honor, Ms. Davenport, um, I, I've tried my best. I've tried to pay this off. And Mr. Eugene's just taking me to court. I'm, I'm trying, but I don't have the money. Ms. Davenport, you going to have more sympathy for him? She says no, but, yeah, yeah, but in reality, come on. Come on now. She, she says you're been to her before, so she got to get back to you for that. I'll do some work for you too. <laughs> what do you need? But, but in, in these situations, you got to be very careful, okay? And understand when people are mad and they're talking lawsuits and all, they're not thinking reasonable. They're not thinking reasonable, okay? And the worst thing you can do as a defendant is what? throw fuel on the fire, okay? Don't do it. If there was reliance on information that's received in writing, the information received in writing, as well as given the written notice of the reliance, but did not know or could have known, can provide a defense as well. You receive the information. This comes back to that wholesaler's disclosure. The question is, Mr. Uh, Travis, if you were gonna sell Mr. Eugene's house today, have you ever lived in his house? Yeah. No. Do you know anything about his house? Yeah. No. So you're going to have to rely on who? No. Rely on Mr. Eugene. So if Mr. Eugene puts in there that he has no termites, and he has no structure issues or electrical issues and all this, would you know? 
If you're not a licensed electrician or an engineer, no. So in that situation is, he's relied on the information that Mr. Eugene gave him. So the true responsibility comes back on who? Mr. Eugene, not on Travis, okay? There are, of course, there's a couple of unsuccessful defenses. I'll let y'all go through those cases. We're not, we don't have all night to go through the cases. I could be here all night talking about them, but I want y'all to go through and read these different cases because there are different unsuccessful attempts. Sometimes people will do certain things or kind of be a little shady or stuff like that. It doesn't work like this, okay? You got to be very careful in your defenses. Now, of course, groundless lawsuits, the attorney's fees and court costs to the defendant in that lawsuit. So groundless brought in bad faith, purpose of harassment are going to be some of the key ones that they're going to end up coming into. One of the primary objectives of the legislation that was created in 2011 exemption was to insulate licensees from these different groundless lawsuits. Prior to 2011, guess what happened? There was so many DTPA suits filed against real estate agents, it was crazy. Person would end up having an inspection done after the inspection was done. You know, they'd go in, inspections all taken care of. The, the defendant, Mr. Eugene, you are buying, uh, you're buying Mr. Grossman's house. You hired Ms. Davenport to do a full inspection, okay? And Ms. Davenport, there was no issues when she went there. That time, everything's perfect, no issues. And then after you move in, 20 days later, there's a ton of issues. And so then you go over and you sue Stefan because of the fact is, as you say, that Stefan ended up, he caused that damage. Well, that's not really the truth. Or you may have a lot of money and you're just upset because you didn't get the price that you wanted. You ended up paying 15000 over and you're upset. So you're suing him just for the sole purpose to harass him. So you get, so you didn't get your 15000 less and you're not going to let him have it. You're just going to wrap it all in real estate and attorneys. And, and Stephen just had to pay 15000 in attorneys. So that's how it's going to be. Well, guess what? That's not going to be part of this anymore. You actually, Mr. Grossman, can actually add his attorney's fees and court costs onto you. So if he racks up $15,000 in attorney's cost, guess what? The judge is gonna send that right back to you, Mr. Eugene, and now you're 30 in the hope, okay? So you gotta be very careful in these situations. Of course, the ethical and legal concerns. You should always understand that just because you may be exempt on certain things under the, under the DTPA, do not simply think that I can do whatever I want, that you're immune, okay? Your license can still be revoked. It can be suspended. Like Ms. Leela and I were talking last night, the worst place you want to be is sitting in the hot seat in front of Trek. You don't want to be sitting there. See, at least when you go to a court of law, there's one judge. So there's only one person that's sitting here staring at you. Okay, but when you're at Trek, you got a lot of people looking down on you. You don't want that. You don't want that. So again, you do not want to end up having to go before Trek. You do not want to end up in the situations you don't want NAR. You never want a letter from NAR saying you violated their code of ethics. Because here's the thing, NAR has just as much weight as Trek does. Because without NAR, you can't be a member of the MLSs. So it's kind of like in Mr. Eugene, in your terms, it's like you got to build this particular coupling, but we're not going to give you the machines. You just got to make it happen. Yeah. How's that going to work for you? It ain't. ain't. So in that situation is you got to be very careful. And while they may not get you under DTPA, there's plenty of other legal and ethical matters that they can get you up. So the key points from the DTPA is a DTPA to protect the consumers from any false or any misleading business practices. The DTPA consumer may not have to prove 
intention to deceive. It may recover economic damages, attorney's fees, and court costs. If knowingly, it can be up to three times the amount. The best defense is always to encourage the use of third party experts. Mr. Grossman has a client that he himself wanted to do his own inspections. While we do not agree with that, and we strongly are against it, who ultimately do we have to answer to, Mr. Grossman? To the client or to ourselves? The client, not us. So if your client ever says, well, Mr. Eugene, I, you're, I'm, I'm your client, you're my agent, Mr. Eugene. Mr. Eugene, do you think that that's a that's foundation issue up there? Huh? Well, I, I need to know. What do you think? I just want. Oh, what do you think? I, I can't tell you. I don't know. Come on, now. Let's not. We don't want to do all this legal mumbo jumbo. What, is that foundation or not? Come on, now. I don't know. I can't answer that. Come on. All right, Mr. Travis. You, he won't. Tell, it's. It's. It is foundation, right, Travis? It is, right? Uh, it might be, it might not be. I would suggest being an inspector in here to check that out. Oh, I'm God, this legal. It is, isn't it? I don't know. I, 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 there you go. What am, what am I trying to do? Get them to, to say what I'm trying to want them to say. Because what happens, Mr. Tra or Mr. A, if I get them to say it is, now what can I do? I come back and sue you. So you got to be very careful. If your client is persistent on getting you to say something, don't say. Uh-uh. I've been in that that boat before. How do you not know, Justin? You've been in real estate over a decade. You freaking teach the stuff. How in the heck do you not know? And my response is, I don't have that license. I can't answer that. It's just like as an attorney, I'm not licensed to practice law. I may know the answer. I can't tell you. I'm sorry. And I don't care if you're going to ask me a million times, the answer is still going to be no. Like my mother says, what do you not understand? The N or the O? Okay? It's no. Again, there are specific exemptions for real estate brokers and salespersons. As a broker, you should always train your associates properly through the methods of obtaining information and how to relay the information to clients and or customers or consumers. There needs, of course, to be a written policy to document all contacts and sources of information. And one thing I want to add in here real quick before we get to the discussions is whenever I'm dealing with a first time home buyer or I'm dealing with an investor, most of the time it's a first time home buyer, majority of the time. After an inspection, if there's a lot of things on the inspection report, I always give my inspection report to my client and I always tell them, like Mr. Travis, I get an inspection. I'll say, here, Mr. Travis, here's the inspection from Ryan. He just completed it. Can you go through it? See if there's anything that's concerning of you, to you. And then once you've gone through it, sir, can you call me and let's go through it? Okay. I want you to read through it and then call me. So then Travis calls me and he's like, oh man, Justin, that's that one AC part scares me. The, the, you know, the roof, I'm kind of worried about the roof condition. Those are my two biggest ones. What do you think is a wise choice if he's a for sale buyer, or, I mean a first time home buyer? I may know it, but what's a good recommendation? So these are your two, the, we'll say the, H, the, the AC and we'll just say AC and roof. These are your two concerns? Yes, these are my two. Okay, then let's do this. How about we call out Garrett and let's call out such and such and have them come out and get us some free estimates on those two products. Okay, so we have these people come out. I had Travis come out and meet with them and they tell Travis, well, the AC, that's normal, Travis. If this, this year and everything is A, that's normal. You don't need to do anything. It's just going to be like that. But then Ms. Davenport comes out, looking at the roof and is like, oh, God, I believe, Travis, this roof up here is horrible. You need a new one. And it's going to be $20,000 to replace. 
In that situation, you're using third parties, experts to come out to actually give estimates so your clients know what they're looking at. Because the worst thing you want is after we close the transaction with Travis, here comes Ms. Davenport out to give an estimate that I thought it was only 5,000 in damages, it's actually 20,000 in damages, okay? So, Mr. Aiden, come up here, please, sir. We've got to make this quick, so don't, don't play around. All right. Mr. Aiden, uh, Mr. Stephan, y'all two, real quick, do this for me. All righty, question one. Um, what is the purpose of the DTPA? Uh, Garrett, can you give me that one? Tech consumers. Yep, perfect, right? Uh, list some of the activities that would be considered violations of the DTPA. Not in the classroom. Not in the classroom. Not in the classroom. Oh come on. Not in the classroom. For real. Yeah, Miss Lila's mad too. <laughs> but not Miss Lila either. Miss Lila got picked on a lot yesterday. Okay, I can go with that. <laughs> uh, Keith. Um, I would say uh, any deceptive acts, uh, misleading statements, uh, mild misrepresentation, uh, representation, excuse me. Uh, that's what I got. You're right, you're right. Anything knowingly or unknowingly uh, could be. Yes, yes. Number three, compare and contrast the actual representation under common law, statutory fraud, and the DTPA. Mr. Jacob, can you answer that one for me? What was that? What was that? What was the question? Compare and contrast the actions for fraud and misrepresentation under common law, statutory fraud, and the DTPA. Uh, what did I tell you unconscionable was? 
Shock. Shock. Yeah. Shock. So shock. what is one? So constitution. Hey, oh yeah. Yeah, girl pregnant. Yeah, let's go yeah, back to the first one. It's still a form of deception. Um, well, let's just move on. You got to turn slide anyways. A producing cause is a contributing factor that in the ordinary sequence produces injury or damage. What is the difference between or in the burden of proof in common law statutory fraud cases and DTPA. Miss Sheldon, what do you think, girl? I think my brain is fried. <laughs> yeah, I did that. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> Me three. <laughs> um, let's let's take it in quick little let's take it in like sequence, like little tidbits here. So a producing cause is contributing factor. So that's what it is. It's this particular situation caused the damage in an ordinary sequence and produces the damage. So what is the difference in the burden of proof in common law statutory fraud, keyword fraud, and ETPA cases? Money? In that situation, yes. DTPA is going to cause a civil matter that's going to result in damages of monetary loss, while fraud is going to result in possible jail. Gotcha. Make okay. sense? Yes. Okay. Mr. A, discuss the specific examples of when a consumer might perceive a licensee's opinion as fact, thus making the conduct actionable against the licensee under the revised DTPA. Um, you need to be specific in, in what you do know and what you don't know. And if you're not licensed in any particular area, you shouldn't point to, like give specific points or examples. You need to be very careful in regards to what you're actually saying is the key thing I wanted to imply there. Yes. Okay. All right. So we're going to take a second. We're going to change over real quick and we'll start the next chapter.